Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, welcome to the new school. My name is Karen Kooni. I'm the director of the Vera List Center for Art and Politics and delighted to welcome you to another um, extraordinary night of um, a public art fund talks here at the new school. Tonight we're seeing and hearing and learning from Yinka Shonibare and I am particularly pleased because for us it's a return welcome of Yinka to the New School, to the Verily Center, where he spoke pretty much to the day 10 years ago in a panel labeled Art and Money that was co-organized together with Art Forum International. Um, Yinka Jonibare is a um, well and highly respected, well recognized, highly respected artist. The MBE in his name stands for member of the British Empire. And I think there are few artists who have mined the notion of empire more productively, more deeply, and um, also more profoundly than Yinka. I look forward to, their com to the conversation that Yinka will have with um, Nicholas Baum, the uh, uh, president, director, and chief curator of the Public Art Fund, who will now introduce Yinka. Thank you all very much for coming and enjoy the evening. Thank you, Karen. I think you just gave me a promotion. Um, our president, Susan Friedman, is, is here uh, tonight. And uh, on behalf of all of us at Public Art Fund, it's a thrill to be here at the New School. Um, thank you so much, Karen, uh, Executive Director of the Vera List uh, Center, and Pam Tillis, uh, Director of Public Programs here at the New School. It really uh, does such an amazing job, and this is a collaboration and a partnership that goes back many, many years and has presented many astonishing artists. And this, I'm happy to say, is the launch of our 2018 spring season, and uh, we'll be hearing on March 27th from the wonderful American artist Amanda Ross Ho, and on April 30th from the very eminent German artist Anselm Kiefer. So do join us for both of those, I think, very special talks. But tonight, we're, uh, we're going to hear from Yinka Schonabare. Um, Yinka's career spans almost 30 years, although I think he's very much a mid-career artist. He certainly has become one of the most distinctive artists of his generation. Playful, provocative, and prescient works about the complex and interdependent nature of our post-colonial world. From what he's called fantasies of black empowerment within white society to monumental abstract public works like his newest public art fund project, Wind Sculpture SG1, opening tomorrow at Doris Friedman Plaza at the entrance to Central Park on view there until October 18, after which it will travel to its uh, future home at Davidson College in North Carolina. His career really began, uh, I think, when he sort of came onto the scene very much associated with painting, but he has explored a great number of different mediums and practices, uh, including sculpture, installation, photography, film, works on paper, even virtual reality. Um, he has, over the last uh, eight or nine years, um, really gotten involved in public art, which of course has led to, to his uh, engagement here with us. Um, and he even ha uh, has a series called Guest Projects, where he enables other artists to have uh, exhibition space free in London and is developing a similar program in Lagos in, in Nigeria. So, an extraordinarily diverse, generous, and ambitious body of work. He studied in London um, at Goldsmiths College, really at the same time that what we have come to know as the young British artists, the YBAs, uh, were emerging, 
And in fact, Yinka was a part of the sensation exhibition uh, that was so closely associated with that YBA school. However, I think Yinka has always sort of stood apart uh, from that group as, as perhaps a more conceptually driven and focused artist who of course also brings the unique perspective of his British Nigerian background. He was born in London in 1962 uh, and moved to Lagos uh, at the age of three with his family. Uh, but they were back and forth to London as well. And he returned to London full-time uh, to go to art school, um, ultimately to Goldsmiths, and began his sort of exhibition career in 1989. He's had since then exhibitions at major museums and galleries all over the world, um, and is in, in collections in major centres, Tate, the v &A, the National Museum of African Art at the Smithsonian, MoMA here in New York, the National Gallery of Canada, his mid-career survey that uh, as a Sydney-born curator, I'm happy to say was at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney in 2008, of course came here to the Brooklyn Museum uh, following that. He has shown in the Venice Biennale uh, on a couple of occasions in Documenta, in Castle. He was nominated for the Turner Prize in 2004. Um, he has the MBE that Karen mentioned and uh, in 2013 was elected a Fellow of the Royal Academy. He shows in London with Stephen Friedman Gallery and in New York City uh, with James Cohan Gallery and uh, a big thank you to Jim and Jane for their amazing advocacy and support for Yinka's work. Um, Yinka and I are going to um, have a conversation. We'll welcome your questions uh, as well. And so for now, let's get on with the show and please join me in welcoming Yinka Shonabari. So now, now we're sort of switching into the space age mic mode. Um, okay. Yinka arrived, I think while we're just getting equipment. Take it that way. Um, Yinka, you, you just arrived yesterday, I think. Um, is it yesterday? Time's, <laughs> time's gone quickly. Um, straight from London and, uh, and seeing this work that you've been creating over the last few months um, and jumped straight in today to doing press and, and uh, interviews and photo sessions. Um, so thank you very much for, for being with us tonight and taking this opportunity to, to kind of talk to an audience um, in this wonderful uh, new theater. I think the last time you were at the new school this probably wasn't even built. Yes, that's correct, yeah. So, um, so Yinka, let's maybe um, dive in. I think many people are familiar with your work, um, but probably there are, there are students and others here who may be learning about it as well. So I thought um, it would be would be worth sort of going back to perhaps the beginning of your career when the sort of works for which you uh, started to, to become known, um, works like Double Dutch uh, from 1994, um, work that uh, in a sense really um, set the stage for the body of work that you've gone on to, to create since then. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about sort of how you started uh, and, and kind of happened on this uh, use of the fabric that's so associated with West African clothing um, and the idea of sort of turning that into a, a kind of pictorial language almost? Yes, um, well, 
first of all, thanks for you know inviting me, and thank you for you know the commission. Um, you know, so and glad to be able to share the work with a lot of people. But I will go back to the beginning, as it were. Um, well, I you know studied life drawing uh, at uh, Barham Shaw School of Art, and then you know second year. The work got more kind of political. I was engaged in, uh, you know, politics, and I was very interested in, you know, things going on in the world, and of course, you know, um, the context of my art. So the kind of art that other, that other artists were making, and um, you know, this is a story I often tell, but. I go over it again and again, just so that people understand the, where the work actually developed and, and where it came from. Um, so I was making work about uh, perestroika, which is uh, what was actually happening in Russia at the time, uh, the then Soviet Union, um, you know, as a politicized student, uh, you know, wanted to expand the, the, the range and the scope of the practice. Uh, one of my tutors said, well, you know, you're making work about Russia. Uh, why aren't you producing authentic African art? Now, I grew up in a very uh, busy city, Lagos, uh, Nigeria, and also in London. And I wondered what that meant, you know, what would be authentic African art? How could one actually produce that, given that actually a lot of contemporary Africans have a multiplicity of experiences. And so I went to Brixton Market in London in search of my African authenticity. <laughs> and I came across a shop where the uh, African textiles were being sold. So I was speaking to them about the textiles. And I, was, I always imagined that the fabrics were you know, authentically quote unquote, African. Uh, and then I was informed that actually, you know, they're Indonesian influenced fabrics produced by uh, the Dutch and then uh, for, sold into, you know, West Africa. And uh, the fabrics were not as desirable, the industrially produced versions were not as desirable to Indonesians. Uh, so, and there are also other stories about the fabrics, uh, about some soldiers who'd served also uh, uh, brought the fabrics back uh, to Nigeria and other African countries. Um, so that's where that story began. But this happened in the context of debates around, you know, of course, um, you know, post-68, we all know that in the art world, you know, many questions were being asked about what kind of art do we have in the museums? You know, the exclusion of women, the exclusion of ethnic minorities, and many artists wanted to be, you know, part of that conversation. Many artists from different cultures, and um, at the time, uh, um, you know, people like Cindy Sherman, Rosemary Trocco, Barbara Kruger. Um, you know, a lot of those artists, you know, and I was looking at people also, you know, um, Leon Golub, Nancy Sparrow, um, understanding that actually art can move beyond, uh, uh, beyond, beyond just the object in, in itself. Um, but of course, I've been trained, uh, you know, as a painter, and of course, you know, the history of painting, um, you know, art for art's sake, um, all of those, and I wanted to actually reappropriate abstract painting by actually, uh, you know, painting directly onto the on, onto the patterns. So then, I mean, of course, you know, we also have you know, uh, pop art, uh, popular culture into art, and so you know, the influences were mostly kind of uh, a mixture of kind of you know. Uh, uh, conceptual art practice and pop art. And, and so, and then my, I kind of tried to evolve my own practice in relation to my own identity. 
And the formal solution you came up with, I mean, it's interesting, it's, it's not sort of a single canvas, it's actually a multiplicity across a grid and, and also kind of painted on a pink wall. So it, 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 it's, it's almost sort of, it's an in painting as installation, which seemed also to foreshadow how you've worked. Well, yes, I mean, Given that I was actually in the live room and I was told when I, when I was at art school, you know, don't use, don't use vulgar colors in your painting. <laughs> don't, uh, don't use black, um, you know, and I wanted to go against all of my training. And so it was a kind of, a, it was almost like a sort of rebellious act, but through, through the artwork. And of course, you know, I mean, as you can see, you know, I do have, you know, physical uh, restrictions and I, I thought that actually, why do I need to make one huge uh, heroic painting? You know, I can actually break that down into components uh, and uh, deconstruct this notion of serialization. And, and um, you know, and then that, that's kind of how uh, I evolved that, that way of working. And you were interested, I think, too, at the time in some of the sort of French post-structuralist writing and Yes. Ideas of, of semiotics and... Uh... Well, yes, I mean, obviously, um, in questioning this idea of the stereotype, uh, you know, what is authentic African, uh, authentic African art, I actually, so I moved from the radical politics itself into the questioning of language, so into the politics of representation. And so, I mean, you're all aware of that Magritte painting. Uh, it's the painting of a pipe. But then underneath it says, this is not a pipe. So a painting of a pipe, it's actually not a pipe. It is a representation of, the, of a pipe, but actually, most fundamentally, it's just paint. You know, it's not, it's paint on canvas. It is not a right. pipe. Two dimensions. So, so then, we then get to the things that we use to represent things. I don't know if that makes any sense. So those things though, are not necessarily intrinsic to the thing that we are representing. So that prejudice kind of works in the same way. Right. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah. It, yes, so, and then this is where semiotics comes in, right? Um, the, so that the signifier, right, is, is not, uh, re, is, it, it's not continuous with the signified. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that you can take you know, the things that we believe to be natural things are not necessarily so. They are culturally determined. Is that? You mean that big sculpture isn't really a piece of fabric blowing in the wind? No. <laughs> <laughs> it is not. It's fiberglass. Yeah. yeah. No, and I think... Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, obviously, in a way, this is one of the insights that, that someone of, you know, hybrid background and, uh, you know, the post-colonial kind of condition has the ability to perhaps step outside of what is taken for granted as natural and, and to see those points of rupture yes. and draw attention to them. No, no, I mean, absolutely. So then I came across, you know, Roland Barthes, you know, mythologies, and then, you know, um, you know Derrida's kind of, you know, deconstruction, you know. Um, so this, this is kind of just basically the kind of dismantling of the canon, you know, the kind of the historical patriarchal canon is seen as being biased, you know, in the sense that actually, you know, things have to, things don't always have to be 
the way they've always been. You know, I mean, I know that, you know, we men, we like it to be a man's world <laughs> because that's what we want. But it's not necessarily a man's world, <laughs> you know. And so and those are the things that artists, you know, start to, to kind of unravel. And, you know, and so it is, of course, the politics of language or the politics of representation, you know, I mean, it's a radical politics brought into language, you know, so, so and that is kind of then what's kind of, that's what manifests in the way that I, you know, I do my art. Yeah. And, and, um, I think if we, I mean, we, we have a ton of slides and we're not going to really be able to talk about everything. Um, but I think as, as we all know and love Yinka's work, um, the, it, uh, it can be very um, forceful and provocative, but it's always very sumptuous and seductive at the same time. Um, your, your painting practice um, with, with these... Uh, you know, kind of assembled multiple elements, often painted wall environments, um, yeah, yeah. really sort of taking painting out of that traditional frame. Yes, I mean, you know, I think that the important thing for me is that material is an important aspect of my practice. So that, you know, um, you know, painterly painting is kind of deconstructed. So, um, you know, it is painting, but then it's not painting. It kind of moves beyond the boundaries of, of painting. Because I don't feel that, well, at the time I was doing those, I felt that um, whilst I enjoyed it, I also felt that I didn't have more to say about painting. You know, I, I didn't want to restrict the frame of my creativity to just painting. And so then I moved on to, uh, you know, to the body, to cost, you know, to kind of um, costumes. I mean, the work expanded beyond painting into installation, and then it also expanded, you know, into uh, the human body and into, uh, power within the body and also power and fashion. Right. You know, and then I went to Victoria and Albert Museum and I was actually looking at historical kind of Victorian costumes. And then also trying to understand the issue, you know, particularly in the, in the UK, the issue of uh, fashion and class, you know, and that actually by, fa by deconstructing those um, Victorian costumes, I'm also exploring my own uh, colonial um, you know, identity. I'm trying to find sort of um, provocative ways of um, doing kind of art as fashion. So they, there's, because I don't actually see that there's a boundary between, um, you, you know, between all the different uh, um, kind of art forms. And so my work kind of straddles. I mean, that's, you know, it was really realizing that my painting could move beyond just painting. It could right. actually move into, you know, and then that's how I arrived at that. Yeah. Kind of. So tell, this is an early installation. Yeah. Um, You've, you've sort of created uh, a human space, but without the body. Um, but tell us about your thinking behind this piece. No, I mean, this is a piece called Victorian Philanthropist Parlor. And um, I, w I wanted to actually look at the, I was, at this time I was looking into the power relationship between the Victorian era, but how it manifests in uh, the identity of someone like myself, who on, on the surface of it might seem completely disconnected to the Victorian era, but then there's of course a, um, a connection there. 
you know, given my own education and, you know, Nigeria being, you know, an ex-colony ex, uh, of the United Kingdom. So, um, and then I was invited to do a show about flags. So I was thinking about nationalism and then the notion, you know, the idea of the black footballer who is carrying the flag for England. Um, and so what's the nature of that relationship between uh, somebody from an ex-colony representing the country that they were colonized by? And so that's how, so on that wallpaper, uh, there are lots of images of, um, you know, uh, footballers of African origin, right. but, but placed within this kind of, you know, setting. Right. Yeah. So that's how that work evolved. But uh, can we see the next uh, slide? Yeah, so, and then this is um, a piece by you know, uh, Gainsborough. It's kind of deconstructing that Mr. and Mrs. Andrews and uh, iconic sort of British aristocratic portrait. Yes, and this painting is at the National Gallery, and there's a couple standing, newly married uh, couple, you know, in front of their estate. Uh, so, again, it, a lot of the the sort of um, images that I should be, you know, uh, afraid of because of the history. I decided to actually be playful with them. And so, you know, you've got, you know, the painting Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, and then, you know, this painting is called, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, you know, without their heads. Did you playfully cut their heads off? Yeah, no, absolutely. And at that time, <laughs> and the, that whole period of, you know, doing that kind of work, you know, that kind of just started as a, you know, f uh, as a joke about the French Revolution, really. And then, um, and then also as a device for avoiding fixing the figures racially, mm -hmm. uh, because I felt that the kind of you know, racial stereotyping and the kind of prejudice. So I wanted to actually make a work that would somehow you know, sort of move, move beyond that. Um, but yeah, so should we go into the next, uh, next slide? Sure. Yeah, so. This indeed is actually my first public art. Well, I was going to say, wasn't um, yeah, wasn't this in a way really conceived as a public art? Project? Yes, no, this was actually a series I made for the London Underground, and there were huge posters. I mean, now there's a lot of art on the London Underground, but at that time, actually, uh, there wasn't art, you know, on the under, on the London Underground, and. Um, I ca I've came up with this idea of having uh, huge posters in the, in the London Underground. So, um, and I was also very interested in, in the works of Oscar Wilde at that point because I somehow identified with him, Oscar Wilde being an Irish man who, um, you know, through the influence of his mother as well, was kind of highly politicized. And um, he was not a member of the aristocracy, but he was, you know, through his wit and his style, he managed to kind of, um, um, you know, somehow ridicule um, the aristocracy you know, with satire and his writing. And, um, you know, so this series is based on uh, Hogarth's uh, Rake's Progress. And, you know, I put myself in and, um, you know, had a great time dressing up, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, and, the, well, the, the one on my left wasn't necessarily on the underground, and I was too provocative, so I didn't have that. <laughs> but, but the others were. And so, that, so that, that's the kind of the performative element started to kind of enter the work at this point. And this... And was that something that sort of the idea of doing a piece for the underground sort of forced you to, to think about how you would translate your work into, into that format? Or how, how did that context sort of lead you into doing this? Well, I mean, I conceived of the entire uh, project. I mean, I had no idea that I'd be allowed to put the work on the underground. Oh, so it wasn't, they didn't sort of come knocking on oh, your no, door? Oh, no, not at all. No, right. no. I mean, it, that was before Art on the Underground. I mean, that, there's... Right. A, program now called yeah. Out on the Underground. Yeah, we have that too. Yes, but that was before that. Um, 
I felt that I wanted a, you know, well, you know, the usual young artist with a huge ego. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, you know, and I just wanted to see if it, was, if it would be possible. So I approached uh, an organization called Institute of International Visual Arts in London, and they, um, you know, they somehow um, let me, they, they helped me to kind of, you know, fundraise and, and make it happen. Right. Yeah. And so would these, the, the series in one station, or were they distributed over multiple stations? No, multiple stations, stations. yeah, or, about 40 or so. I mean, it was quite, a, yeah. So you had to make your own progress to explore them all? Well, yes, I mean, you could see them as you were on the platform, because they're like huge, you know, huge posters right. uh, in front of you. But I mean, this work then led on to, uh, and can we see others? We, yeah, oh, sorry, let we me can go jump. Back. No, no, we can jump. I, I yeah. won't. Okay. I won't talk about them individually. Um, um, well, this is um, well. You know, we all know this painting, the Fragonard's uh, painting. But um, like, can we go to the next? Well, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> You're skipping over these major works, Yinka. No, no, this is. Um, so this this work was at. Um, it's okay. It's an adult audience. <laughs> so the, 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 this work was at uh, Documenta. So this was my piece for Documenta. I, I reckon this is Oakwe. It was Wesel's Documenta Eleven. That's right. Um, yes. So I thought, you know, being at Documenta for the first time, I, I should make a grand entrance. Um, um, you know, but, but um, so this is a gallantry and criminal conversation. Um, at the time, I was actually reading a book about uh, the Grand Tour in Venice. I w and then equally, in the news at the same time, uh, there were things about, you know, uh, um, um, sexual kind of exploitation in places like Thailand and so on. So um, the, the idea of, you know, the rich countries or, you know, wealthy countries against sort of, you know, poor, poorer countries and the kind of exploitation ca that can happen in that power relation, you know, in those power relations. And, um, uh, you know, during the Grand Tour in the 18th century, people would go to Rome and Venice and they would, you know, take in culture, which is what they were there for, but they would do other things as well. And, um, you know, so this work is sort of, exploring a potentially kind of serious subject in a, you know, in, in a kind of lighter manner, I guess, yeah. Which is a very sort of characteristic move of yours, I think, you know, that um, sort of offering the critique wrapped in, in a, a kind of witty frame or, you know, some kind of... No, but you see, I, I always think that I've always, you know, I've always thought that um, Artists are primarily, you know, we're pr primarily kind of performers. You know, we entertain. I mean, I, I believe that, you know, just because something is critical doesn't mean that it can't also be engaging and entertaining. Because you want to engage people, you want to engage different, you want to engage them on, on different levels. Right. And I feel that, you know, if the work was, I mean, of course, there's nothing wrong with dry work, but that's just not my personality. If it's, if it's dry, people will either get defensive or not want to engage with it. So, and, you know, and of course, you know, gallows humor is important. You know, I feel that, you know, yes, I mean, the work may be engaging, but there are, uh, there's always a kind of a dark underbelly somewhere. Speaking of which, yeah, so this is a Scramble for Africa, and this is when the conference happened in Berlin, and Africa was kind of divided up uh, between uh, the nations in Europe, and they didn't necessarily ask Africans if they wanted to be a country. They just drew lines in the ground and said, you know, okay, Nigeria, that's your country. Even if you don't like the guy next door, it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> um, and that's how a lot of those countries, you know, literally were made by just, 
you know, European countries kind of sharing bits of it. And you actually have the map in, in the middle of the table. Um, yes, so it's a kind of an imaginary uh, conference of a whole lot of, you know, headless men um, dividing Africa up. So this is sort of an intriguing piece uh, that I, I don't know um, where you've got these two figures sort of shooting a gun. Yeah, so this, this is actually the National Gallery in London. And so I removed portraits of uh, Connell Talton and Mrs. Oswald, who used to be, I mean, they were slave owners. And so the National Gallery uh, removed those portraits and I was asked to temporarily to do an installation there. And so rather than actually, you know, um, showing the slaves that they owned, I created this metaphor of a pheasant, a pheasant being violently, um, you know, slaughtered. And, and that was uh, in the middle of the National Gallery in London. And so that's what that piece is. Right. Which then, so brings us to your, I guess, first outdoor public commission, a public piece. Um, yeah, so this is um, Nelson's Ship in a Bottle. I mean, for those of you who know, uh, there is the public art project, or rather like the New York Public Art Fund in London, uh, and that's in Trafalgar Square. And so the fourth, the plinth. fourth plinth is actually a competition. So you're not, you're not invited, you have to actually compete right. to, get, to get that. Um, and you know, I don't like competitions at all. Right. I don't like competitions because I like to win all the time. <laughs> <laughs> You know. But how can you win if you're not in a competition? <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> so I, don't, I tend not to enter a lot of competitions. Um, but I couldn't resist uh, the one in Trafalgar Square. And, you know, so I made a work that I thought was, um, you know, that suited the, the context. And there's N Nelson's column there. Um, Nelson fought the battle of uh, Trafalgar against... Napoleon. At that time, the French had control of the waters, the seas, and uh, Nelson won that battle. I mean, if he'd lost, I'd probably be speaking French to you now, um, but he won it. And then Britain had the freedom to actually, uh, you know, freedom of movement around to colonize, you know, all these other places and to trade easily. And um, and so, but he won that battle in the boat called HMS Victory. And so I changed, I swapped the sails of that boat, you know, with the textiles that I use. Right. And, and, and so the work is now permanently in front of the Maritime Museum in Greenwich in London. How did you, it must have been an interesting challenge to, I mean, the scale, I imagine many, people in the audience have, have seen the location, but I mean, it's a very grand public spa space. The scale is enormous. You've got, you know, the National Gallery and uh, this big public plaza. You've got great statues, the column. How did you sort of think about taking on that scale of, of space? Well, it's sort of an interesting question because actually the this, this space, the history of the space, I mean, the, the space delivered the work to me mm -hmm. because, you know, I mean, that's the only way I can, I can put it really. I, I wanted something that, because, you know, mind you, Trafalgar Square, there are at least, you know, a million people an hour. I mean, you know, going through there. You know, it's an incredible flow of traffic. Yeah. Not to mention the pigeons. Well, well, exactly. You know, so I think that um, it's very difficult to, I find public art the most difficult thing to do because you have to 
you can't rely on an audience that's sympathetic to what you're trying to do. But it's also the most politically engaged thing to do as well, because you're, you know, people have access. It's not like being in a museum where you have to pay. In some museums, you know, it's... Um, so I like that political aspect, you know, public art, that it's accessible to a lot of people. But then it's also challenging because particularly in London, everyone has a view, you know, every black cab driver has a view of what should be on there. And they argue with you about it. Right. You know, so, so um, did you enjoy hearing those opinions and responses? Well, it's interesting because you go, you go from just being known by people in the art world to people in the street knowing about your work right. and talking about it. So I like that aspect of it, that actually, you know, it makes it accessible in a way that, you know, gallery shows can't actually make your work. But were you surprised by the responses? I mean, how did, you know, was it, was it sort of a... I different mean, I kind think of... That, well, I mean, I think I was lucky. People really liked the work, and people liked the work for, you know, all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of reasons. I mean, there were people who thought that this is so good, for, you know, I'm doing something really great for the nation. It's really celebrating Nelson. It's uh, fantastic, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then, you know, there are people who... Um, were well, kind of really on the left and like, oh, great, you know, challenging the system, <laughs> you know. So, so, um, but, and that, but you see, I honestly don't, I can't tell you exactly where I stand myself because I'm ambivalent. You know, like, I mean, for example, uh, when I received my MBE, you know, I considered that I was a real kind of rebel artist and everything. But, you know, between you and me, don't tell anyone. I enjoyed going to the palace. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um, so but, that's, but that's the kind of contradiction that, the, that you can have right. within yourself. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, obviously, you're at the heart of what was the empire. Yeah. And so no longer those institutions of that era live on as these kind of vestiges. Um, the empire's gone, but you, you can still be a member of it. Um, you're a royal academician. Um, all, all of those, it must be, uh, you know, fascinating to have that sort of now be on the inside of uh, that, you know, institutional frame. Well, I mean, you know, on, on a more serious note, I think that... Uh, you know, particularly with institutions like the Royal Academy, I think that there's no point standing on the outside, you know, complaining. I think it's actually better to try and transform those in institutions from the inside because those are the structures that you've got, you know, those are the structures. And if you want, if you want them to change, you have to change them. You know, you can't wait around hoping they're going to change, mm -hmm. praying they're going to change. Um, you have to be involved. You have to participate if you want those institutions to change. Right. And that's how I feel about it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's another thing that artists, you know, taking on major public commissions have to think about. In, in a sense, you know, I think um, sometimes work gets criticized as being spectacular or, or, you know, dismissed as being all about spectacle. Uh, but the reality is in public space, you know, we're competing with the billboards of Times Square and, and the digital displays and, you know, all of that horsepower of, uh, you know, the, the industrial and advertising complex. So. Um, so I think it's so brilliant that you came up with a solution, for instance, in, in this work that took such a kind of vernacular form of, of a ship in a bottle, um, not a sort of fine art reference or, or you know, um, framework. And, uh, 
you know, and then we're able to sort of turn it into a monumental sculpture and be so accessible in that way, um, but really sort of use your own language and bring your own thematics in, into the frame. So, so congratulations on, on that. It, it is very, I mean, you said it's hard to do public sculpture and I, I, can, I can testify um, how, how difficult that is and how many artists really struggle with that challenge of, um, you know, taking on a space where people, you can't assume any knowledge of your work, um, but uh, you, want to, you want to communicate and have that direct um, exchange with the cab drivers and everybody else. Yes, but the, I mean, that, that's not to say that one is then having to dumb down one's expression as a result right. of that. I feel that um, the difficult thing to do is to hold such complex ideas in a, in a simple form, which, which is actually very, very difficult to achieve. Right. So let's, um, so let's move on. Um, I mean, obviously, your work contains a lot of art historical references as well as pop culture references. Yeah. Um, we'll see, you know, some of those um, ideas of excess come into the work. You, you've done this sort of series where the, the headless mannequin is replaced now with a globe, um, these sort of globe-headed figures, um, which is a sense of sort of the the drunken uh, collapse. Well, I mean, this work, the series you're showing now happened, actually, I, I made those during the kind of, uh, you know, subprime kind of financial crisis and the collapse of the economy and the kind of excess that was sort of happening. I mean, not, not necessarily as a kind of a moral fi finger pointing because, you know, I'm part of the art world and I think the art world is, is, is not immune. Right. You know, from all of the, all, yeah. all of that, um, you know. But the, but then you know this is this is a kind of you know human human uh, uh, weakness in the in the sense that, you know, of course we all desire a more kind of equal society, but we certainly wouldn't you know reject um, the money. You know, it's just human. That's what um, a human failure needs. But politically. Of course, you know, I want things to be more equitable, you know, things to be uh, um, more, more, more equal, but unfortunately, you know, there are people who lose their jobs and as a result of some of these excesses, you know. Um, right. And, and the, the shifts of technology uh, and, and the changes in the structure of the economy and th that are happening, obviously, right now around the world. Um, more of these globe uh, figures, Yes, I mean, that, that's a commission actually for the Bands Foundation, I did uh, a solo show there. And, you know, um, education was very important to uh, Dr. Bands, who... The Bands in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. Yeah. And uh, so as part of my solo show, I did this uh, series of, you know, magic ladder kids, and they are the the rungs of the ladder are actually, you know, books. So it's a kind of a metaphor for aspiration and, you know, through education. And books, of course, are something that we'll we'll come back to as well. It's an important. And you know, and I see, uh, you know, knowledge and books as a means of emancipating yourself. You know, and uh, you know, ed education is very, very important, and so that's kind of how you know those uh, that series came about. Um, and this is it, yeah. Go ahead. Then I was just about to say that you will find that throughout my work, I'm affected by the zeitgeist. You know, uh, things actually going on at that time. And they somehow find my, their way into the things that I make. Right. And the zeitgeist, I guess, now, of course, also being 
about um, the environmental conditions of yeah the no planet? absolutely yes no too right yeah quite right yes you know um, and you know there are things like you know obviously um, the way we're polluting the environment you know climate change um, I mean they're they're kind of quite. Again, you know, how do you find a, a language that can actually talk about these things without being too kind of literal about mm -hmm. them? Right. And, and it's sort of the way that's sort of, you know, engaging, um, entertaining, but, and hopefully reflective, you know, make people sort of think about them. Yeah. Um, you've done this series of uh, sort of quotations of classical statuary well, you know, this series, actually, this is a very, very serious work, uh, the classical sculpture series, because I, I mean, as you know, on, you know, um, the white marble sculpture was, it was a, a German um, art historian called Johann Winkelmann, and he promoted this idea that classical sculpture was white. And this whiteness was meant to represent the Aryan race. And Adolf Hitler actually owned uh, the discourse thrower. And um, of course, we know that uh, classical sculpture was actually you know, originally painted. I mean, uh, they were not necessarily white. Right. And, and in recent times, a wet, you know, the rise of the right the alt-right groups have used white marble classical sculpture as a, their, kind of, their kind of icon to celebrate the supremacy of the Aryan race. So the act of me then taking the white marble classical sculpture and then painting those uh, uh, batik patterns onto them and put in the globe on the, on the heads or swapping the heads for the globe. It's also a way of saying, actually, you know, the Romans got their sculpture from the Greeks and, you know, they were not intrinsic, intrinsically Roman. Right. And so... The Egyptians before that. The Egyptians. It, it, so it's a, property, yeah. it's a property of the world. Yeah. They look uh, light. But the intentions are actually quite serious. Yeah. Um, let's maybe skip ahead a, a little because there are things I want to make sure we we do uh, get to. This work, for example, um, is uh, I think a wonderfully um, a, you know appropriate piece to our times and has also sort of evolved interestingly and will have a kind of American incarnation, um, but began here as, as the British Library in 2014. Yes. Um, can you tell us about Yes, about I mean, work? the British Library uh, came about but, uh, as a result of, uh, I mean, of course, now, you know, we've got Brexit in the UK. Um, the, you know, there was going to be a referendum as to whether to stay in the European Union or to come out. As a result of that, unfortunately, you know, the, the rise of the right, uh, a lot of discrimination against immigrants. And at the same time, there was a war, you know, uh, well, happening in Iraq, happening in Syria. Uh, and those wars, those conflicts creating more refugees. And then there was, an, you know, economic collapse the rise of the right. And I felt that actually, you know, within Britain itself, a lot of people who've made huge contributions to, to the society, you know, their families came from elsewhere. So I wanted to celebrate those immigrants who've made significant contributions to that society and I created uh, a piece called the British Library. And so on the spines of the books are names of, uh, you know, people who'd made a huge contribution to British society, you know, going from, you know, um, Helen Mirren to Salman Rushdie to 
you know, many others, uh, to the Queen of England as well. And so, um, and then I had some computers, you know, some tablets on the table where you could actually look at, you know, you could see the reasons why a lot of, so I had news real uh, footage of uh, the conflicts, people arriving, the reason they came in the first place, and also uh, their names and their backgrounds. It was a and, huge research project. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's a very big research project. And, you know, and I'd like to do this for different countries too, so I had the opportunity to um, you know, there's the front Biennale which, uh, Cle in Cleveland that's yep. going to happen soon. Yep. And so I have the opportunity to, to actually explore first and second generation uh, American immigrants, uh, which is going to be called the American Library. Right. You'll have and, no shortage of material. And <laughs> a huge, uh, you know, a huge amount of research being done to, to make that project happen. Yeah. And I think it's a very important project because, um, you know, people can participate and uh, um, write their own family stories, their own, they can contribute their own, you know, uh, family stories and their own experiences. I feel that it's a very, very important uh, thing for, for, for us to be um, exploring and to be talking about. Yeah. Because I think that that's, you know, Prejudice comes out of ignorance. And people need to actually understand, you know, the opportunities that they have mm -hmm. and where that came from. Right. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, not that art necessarily needs to be moral, but art can, you know, art can actually enlighten people and engage, you know, people. Yeah. So, uh, and I feel that uh, it's a very, right now, at this time in our history, you know, it's a very important thing to be doing. Yeah. Um, you talked about sort of changing institutions from within, um, the Royal Academy being perhaps one example, and this is a, a kind of public piece you did for the facade of uh, the RA. Yes. And uh, called the Family Album. Yes. It's really about sort of including people in a way that they hadn't been perhaps before. Well, so Royal Academy has an incredible um, photography archive. And a lot of people, I mean, myself included, actually, I was, I was quite ignorant of really uh, the history of the Royal Academy and what the Royal Academy did. You know, while, whilst I was on the outside of it, I just felt it was a, you know, an elitist institution. And, um, and then there are many people who make that organization. The you know, Royal Academy is going to be 250 years old this year. And Royal Academy has always had uh, a summer exhibition which is open to the public. And, Royal, and the summer exhibition has never been canceled. Even during the war, the, the, the exhibition continued. And this is something that any member of the public can apply to show there. And there are people who make that institution work, um, like the red collars, those are the men who greet you, and also the staff uh, who work behind the scenes. So when I was, at, when I was asked to do to do something at the Royal Academy, I wanted to include the people that we don't see, photographs of, you know, the cleaners and the, you know, the people you don't see mm -hmm. work there. And so I combined that with both the pictures of the Royal Academicians they have in the archive, plus the people who work there and people who work in the offices and the education programs and, and so on. So that, yeah. that's how that work came about. Great. So um, we, we, I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for audience questions. So let's sort of end on then the, the wind sculpture series. Yes. Um, and, and this began a few years ago, uh, the, the first generation, yes. if you like. Yeah. Um, and, 
Um, in a way, your most abstract work, would, yeah. would that be fair to say? Um, well, in a manner of speaking, but, um, you know, formally so, perhaps, but... Right. Um, but sort of related to Nelson's ship as well? Well, yes. I mean, the wind sculptures evolved out of um, the uh, Nelson's ship in a bottle that I did. After doing the sails for that ship, I thought that actually the, I could create sculptures just out of that. And I like the metaphor of the wind and migration as well. And I wanted to do those um, on their own and outside. So in the first generation, um, you know, the, f the second generation of wind sculptures are kind of more complex than the first, you know, in, in the shape and uh, but this is the first generation. Yes, so that's the that first we've generation. Been yeah. Seeing and and here's a sort of process shot um, of the of the new piece. Yes, and I those were achieved by um, doing sort of well, really for both of them. The first idea was to I was blowing sort of um, a hairdryer into fabric and photographing that, and then seeing what the shapes were. But I also thought it, was, it would be interesting to make non-sculpture. So to make sculpture about nothing, um, about the, what you don't see, which is wind. Because usually, obviously, sculpture is about volume. And, right. and, and, and so I thought I could use the fabrics to try and sculpt something that's not there, which is wind. Yeah. You know, which is why yeah. it's called wind sculpture. <laughs> you know, and and here it is, um, <laughs> yeah. literally a uh, photo we just took earlier today, um, and uh, really looks extraordinary at the at the entrance to the park. Um, well, yes, I mean, you know, I um, enjoyed the process uh, of working on this. And also, what's important about this work is the movement and the dynamism of it. The fabric has a history, you know, we've, we, which we've talked about. So, of course, the work, you know, in terms of the story of America, the story of New York, you know, it's about migration, you know, which is embedded in the story of the fabric. Uh, you know, it's also about the question of, you know, monuments, you know, what kind of monuments do we want to have? And, you know, you know that recently there's been a lot of debate about whether to remove certain monuments or not. I mean, I personally... Is that debate going on in London as well? Well, that debate is everywhere. Yeah. I mean, Oxford yeah. University, um, you know, the Statue of Rhodes, whether to remove that or not. Wow. Uh, in the United States also, as you know. Yeah. We live in different times. We've got different attitudes, but we've got different kinds of people in our society who used to be quite in, you know, invisible. Uh, they didn't, their voices were not heard. My voice wouldn't have been heard about 100 years ago. You know, the world is different now. And I think all those different voices should be made visible in our cities. Mm -hmm. And, but I don't necessarily believe that, uh, you know, those uh, monuments should be destroyed. I don't, in the way that I don't believe that, you know, we should go into the libraries and burn all the books we don't like. Uh, I mean, there could be an argument for saying, perhaps, you know, those works should be moved into museum settings with education uh, programs around them. But if you destroy history, you will forget it. Right. So, um, and, the, and those are my views. But most importantly, I feel that we should be putting up, you know, uh, alternative monuments. So on that note, let's open up to, uh, to the audience and, and see if, um, if anyone has a, a question for Yinka. Um, I see someone's hand uh, up there. Yes, um, do you have a question? 
do we actually, would you mind um, coming down to use the, uh, the microphones? Um, anyone um, who has a question, maybe if you could come down the front um, or we can pass the, the mic. That's Hello. Um, thank you both for this wonderful talk this evening. Um, I was wondering, Yinka, if you could speak to themes or content of disability in some of your work. Well, um, I think that I've done that, but I've done that in, I've done that both in sculpture and also making myself visible in some of my photographs. And I feel that, um, you know, it's done by, by default, I mean, by my, you know, presence, uh, by sort of the content of some of my work. But, you know, no person is one thing. I mean, we're all complex human beings. We may have certain aspects, uh, but we also have others too. So I believe that um, all of those, all of my different sides should be acknowledged, not just the one. Yinka, would it be fair to say in a way that, you know, what might be taken as some limitations have, have in fact given you other ways of, of thinking and doing? Well, I mean, I believe that if you have any kind of, uh, you know, what might be described as a quote-unquote limitation, that's just a platform for other ways of being creative, you know, and, and I think that that's the attitude I take to it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Yinka. Uh, my name is Michelle Bishop, and I'd like to know a little bit more about your process in terms of selecting the textiles from the Dutch com companies, or do you commission the textiles personally for what you want to do? If you could share a little bit more about that process. Okay. Um, so it depends on the work I'm trying to do. Uh, when I do the wind sculptures, I um, design the textiles. And when I make the costumes, I buy them from the market. So, um, but I'd like to, I, I mean, they've become a kind of palette for me now. I just, uh, you know, I like to sort of overlap, and mix the colors the way I want. Um, but, but for the most, I do both, basically. Um, I design and buy, but the one on the wind sculpture, um, I designed. Sometimes they're based on existing designs that I change, or sometimes I just create completely new ones. Yeah. Oh, I see there's a couple of questions um, towards the back. Uh, Hello, I'd like to ask you, who does the sewing for the... Um... <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, that's a very good question. Um, so I, I work in England. There is a very strong tradition of uh, uh, costumiers who work in the theatre. So I've worked with um, you know a number of um, you know costumiers uh, from the theatre, and um, that's so. I mostly I mean I don't work with one person. You know I work with a lot of people. So it depends on the projects that I'm doing. But for the most part, I prefer to work with people with a theatre background because they understand the period costumes hmm. that I use. And yes. Hello. Oh, excuse me. Um, I have a question about your ambition as an artist. And did you ever have a moment as an art student where you came in contact with a work that totally, uh, I guess, expanded your consciousness and made you realize that you could be doing what you're doing today? Um, well, when I was young in Nigeria, um, I used to go to, there's a local museum in Lagos, and I used to go to that local museum. I mean, where I saw, 
Well, first of all, I saw a lot of um, quote unquote, what some people might describe as you know, uh, primitive art, um, but obviously not. Um, and so that was kind of you know, traditional art that I first saw when I was growing up. And then I saw the works of, uh, there's a Nigerian artist called Ben Enwowu uh, in Lagos. Um, and I somehow fell in love with that idea of you know, being an artist. And then when I, you know, when I uh, was at school, um, I had a very good art teacher as well, that sort of encouraged me. And, um, but basically I became an artist because I liked the, work, the works of other artists. I actually can't see where you are. Where are you? Sorry, the light is in my eyes. That's why I'm kind of. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. I'm right here in the middle of the back. <laughs> oh, let me stand up. Oh, there you are. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Um, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Vianno James. Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, that's what I was wondering. Like, I mean, you make monuments, and how did you discover that you could do that and, I mean, take it to this level? And how did you navigate that, like even getting there to this point? Yeah, well, I mean, also, you know, going to art school, obviously, you know, I wanted to go to art school, and uh, somebody from a, I'm from a Nigerian family, and, uh, you know, my father was a, you know, was a lawyer, and in Nigeria, you just don't say you want to be an artist, you know. Uh, maybe now it's different, but then, you know, I was expected to do a kind of, you know, middle-class job, accountant, lawyer, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, I loved doing art so much, I decided I wanted to go to art school. You know, I got some support in the end for doing that, but, um, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a straightforward thing because, you know, I had, to, I had a part-time job when I left art school, um, you know, but I, I loved doing art, so I just kept going at it, I guess. I think we can all be um, grateful that, um, that Yinka did continue to do that. All right, maybe just one last question, gentlemen here. Yeah. Hello, hi, my name is Jacques. Um, oh, hi. I'm, I'm, a, I'm from Togo, Togo, Africa, and I moved to the US when I was nine, and sort of my work is based in um, I'm a fashion student here, so my work is sort of based in navigating my relationship with my Togo culture and my mother's, because um, uh, my mom moved to the U.S. earlier on, so I didn't really know her, so it was sort of about um, based in, you know, like building a relationship with her through the textiles that um, we, were in, we wore in my culture and stuff. So for me, it's all about sort of this idea of performance and um, your piece um, in Bio Mascara, which is like the mask ball, which is something that, which is a piece that I am very interested in. Um, I just want to um, ask, you know, sort of how you translate, how was it for you to translate, you know, your work, um, your sculptural work and your uh, installations into a, perf like into a performance setting and um, sort of what was your th thought process in that? If you can speak a little bit about it or, yeah. And what was the last question? Is there what in that? I'm sorry? What Just was the last question? Um, I think it was sort of based on like the ways that in which you translate your um, work, your installation work in the performance setting, like yeah. as a performance piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that as an artist, it's very important that it's very important to uh, you know, to push yourself, to push the boundaries, you know, of what you're uh, doing. But it's, it's a kind of a difficult thing also if you have a kind of fairly established career, because at, at the point I actually switched to, uh, you know, film and some performance in my work, I already had a fairly established career. But, you know, you want to kind of push my, yourself, you know. I mean, even moving to public sculpture was kind of pushing myself even more. And, um, you know, and there's something kind of performative about my sculptures anyway. And so it just seemed like a kind of logical next step uh, to do. And, um, but
But you know, the work you mentioned, which is for those who don't know it, it's called Umbalo Mascara, and I created uh, a ball, a masked ball, in which the um, king was assassinated. And then I changed the gender of the, queen, of the king also uh, to a woman. And this was based on a Swedish king who was um, you know, fighting wars in Russia uh, while his people were kind of starving, King Gustav III. And so it's based on a Verdi um, opera, you know. And um, uh, so that's kind of the origins of that piece. And I made that piece on a residency in uh, Stockholm, while I, was, while I was in Stockholm. So, and uh, that was uh, very, very interesting to do because I had to sort of, you know, audition the dancers and direct it. And so I was also kind of doing things beyond my training, if you like. But it was very interesting because I learned a lot as well doing that. So, I mean, I, you know, I keep it interesting for myself by kind of, you know, learning new things and pushing, pushing boundaries. Yeah, and I guess well, those, that's the kind of motivation for, for doing it. Right. Well, I think, Yinka, in keeping things interesting for yourself, you're keeping it interesting for all of us. Um, Yinka Shunabari, thank you so much. Thank you.